We're talking about persecution today, you know, stuff being nicked and things going wrong and stuff like that. We've been working through the Beatitudes for those of you who are visiting. Uh, so we've been looking at Matthew 5 in quite forensic detail, really, um, trying to take it verse by verse. And um, uh, today we're hitting on, uh, I think, quite a key one. Obviously, you've got different types of persecution. Uh, you've got grand scale epic persecution about probably, I think, looking at open door statistics from 2014, a Christian somewhere in the world, they were suggesting he's killed every two hours for their faith. It's quite astonishing, isn't it? So you have, do really have sharp end persecution. Um, they say one in ten Christians are, are facing some form of extreme persecution outside of martyrdom as well. Persecuted for going to church, you know, beaten up, put in prison, that kind of thing. Now, obviously, we don't face this, do we? So sometimes we've got to try and contextualize this verse for us today. So let's have a look at this. This is in Matthew 5. Um, I'm reading maybe from a slightly different version. Uh, this is uh, the New American Standard Version. I kind of like it. It's got kind of a majestic feel to it. But uh, let me read this to you from Matthew 5, verse 11. It's a tough one, actually. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you. That sounds pretty tough, doesn't it? Is it tough to you? Blessed are you. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Just just get your head around that a little bit. Blessed are you when people say things about you, give you a tough time or persecute you not only that, when that happens, be really happy about it. Rejoice and be glad when that happens because your reward is in heaven. It is great. It's in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, I was trying to bend my mind around this. I, um, I flew back in early on Wednesday morning and I was straight into work, to be honest with you. Uh, and, and we'd just been hitting the ground running hard since I got back. So I was trying to pause to take some time yesterday just sort of sitting back on the sofa and, and trying to let my mind turn around these verses and 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 trying to get sort of behind the skin of it a little bit really so i'd i want to take a little step back uh before we drill into what does this actually mean for us here in in the west where we are not facing a tough time our our view of persecution might be there's a bit of noise outside that's disturbing our beautiful worship time Oh, the enemy's having a right go at us today. No, it's not. It's just some people outside making a little bit of noise, disturbing our worship time. See what I mean? We're in a very, very different context. So we need to try and take a little bit of a step back. We had a, a, a small group of us a meeting every so often, uh, once, or, once or twice a month, just looking at leadership development. And I shared something uh, that night as I was cycling along uh, for many hours, pouring with sweat. I was sort of praying over stuff in the church. And... Um, I really felt the Lord speak to me, actually, about us um, as we grow and develop and, you know, we're gently seeing people come to Christ and people growing in faith. And, I, and I, it's not a groundbreaking word from the Lord, really, although it could be. I, I sense this from the Lord. I, I, it might just be my own heart. But, I f you know, every organization, every institution develops a character. You know, it just does. You know, Quick Fit will have its own character. You know, Marks and Sparks has a character. Barclays Bank has a character, has a feel to it. I was sensing the Lord saying to me as I was cycling along that, that God is calling us in some ways to be a place that's very gentle. And, and I, it really struck me deeply. I mean, we want to be a place and we're seeking to be a place where people encounter Christ. We want to be a place where people encounter the fullness of the Spirit. We want to be a place where there's joy and family and faith and all of those things. But actually, I felt the Lord say to me, um, and it just came for a time of prayer, actually, just reading through Ephesians most days. It's just my own little personal time before I went cycling. And I don't know how it came about, but just felt the Lord whispering gently to me. He used to have a character gentleness in the church. So I just want that to hover above 
everything we're saying today or sort of speaking into it. I think there's something we're being called to, not to have a, a hard edge, but a gentle edge. And and within that, before we drill into, dwell in, drill into persecution, something that struck me again while I was sitting on my sofa yesterday, having a cup of tea and thinking about things, was to remember, profoundly remember, that every single person on the planet is one of God's beautiful, amazing creations. Every single person. Psalm 139 verse 14 is absolutely clear on it, that we were fearfully and wonderfully made, knit together in our mother's wombs. But that's not just you, that's all people, all people, beautiful in God's sight, needing redemption, full of sin and mess the world is, but every single person is one of God's beautiful creations. So you're thinking, why is Carl saying that when he's talking about rejoice and be glad when you're being persecuted? i tell you why, because in our context, things are a little bit different. We face tough times sometimes in a very different way, and, and I want to focus on that because I, I think when we meet on a Sunday, one of the things we need to do is learn how to live well and learn how to live with grace and learn how to confront difficulties. And we're not at the sharp end of persecution yet, although one day we might well be. But at the moment, it's like, how do we navigate this adventure, this sensational adventure of following Jesus whilst keeping our integrity? We need to remember that every single person is a beautiful creation from the Lord and that we only exist because of the grace of God. And I've said this before, but actually, nanosecond by nanosecond, we are held together because of the grace of God. We can eat, drink, breathe, have opinions, go shopping, do whatever, only because of God's amazing grace. If God decided he wanted to shut it all down, he could. You'd be sitting moment by moment purely because of the grace of God. These are very important principles for us. We also follow a master and commander who had every right to get the hump with us when he's been nailed to a lump of wood, but didn't. Just issued forgiveness, even as he was dying, issued grace and forgiveness. These are our examples, and these are, these are the great overarching truths of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I think these are incredibly important principles for us. So I'm now going to drill through, having said those two things, maybe four or five bullet points that I think are extremely important in how we process and deal with stuff when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you, regardless of how that and why that comes about, but especially if it's because you're a Christian, which is the context of the verse. But I want to look at how we actually handle this stuff anyway, because I think it's very important for us as a character of a church, uh, as, as, a, as we develop the church's character and feel. Uh, first thing is this, and these are just bullet points, just to take away really. Well, I mentioned this when we were with the guys uh, on, on Friday night. One thing I've noticed that's happened to me over the years is that when someone grieves me, when I get hurt, and we all get hurt, don't we? You know, or you, you get a bit chipped up about something because someone said something about you or you've got that nasty email, or you're in a meeting where someone fronts you out and they're just horrible to you, or you hear some thing going on in the life of the church that really winds you up, because surprisingly that can happen, can't it, right? That can even happen in a church full of God's people who know the grace of the Lord. You know, we can get a bit chipped up about each other sometimes. I tell you what I've noticed I do. I objectify people. I, I dehumanize them. The person that's causing me angst stops becoming one of God's beautiful creations and actually becomes an opponent, an enemy, or an object. So, for example, um, I wrote an article about a year ago for Children's Work magazine, um, which wasn't well received by 50% of the Christian commentary population in these areas. 50% thought it was amazing. 50% thought it was a terrible thing that I wrote. Uh, you'll have to read the article and judge for yourself. But I was talking about boys and Sunday school. And I had some opinions 
about how we deal with boys in Sunday school. The 50% of people who didn't like it were uh, from a, a school of thought that said there's no real difference between the genders. So something I happen to disagree with, uh, which came across in the article. But they objectified me. So I became this terrible enemy of gender equality, uh, which is bonkers because it's not where I'm at at all. Uh, and it, it was it was really tough. So people started writing blogs and um, I started getting hassle on Twitter and Facebook and all kinds of stuff. Um, and And some of it was incredibly unreasonable. And even to the point where I'd be in a meeting and someone would raise some point which wasn't even true or people would take words and slightly twist it. Now, when that happens, the temptation is to objectify, like make them objects, the people who are doing that to you and they stop becoming people, they become enemies that you want to destroy <laughs> or you know, you want to write an email or get into some Twitter war and you find in your head crafting the most amazing, witty, cutting, devastating comments that would slay all your opponents, you know. I don't know if you ever found that. No. Is it just me? <laughs> so, you know, or, or in receipt of like a poisonous email, you could just like drive a, a horse and carriage through the holes in their argument and, and be seen to be victorious at the expense of leaving people littered around you, like corpses of your opponents scattered at your feet, you know. That's what happens because what you've done is you've stopped seeing the person as a person. You've started seeing them as an enemy to destroy. Uh, the only way for me to be able to deal with these things is to constantly remind yourself that every single situation is redeemable and every single person is winnable. Redeemable and winnable. So, on this particular example, I was walking in the midst of this storm while I was constructing devastating responses in my head. I was walking through St. Pancras Station and I saw the chief proponent of the opposition forces that were railed against me having a coffee. Can you believe it? They don't even live in London. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I just want to get on my train and go home. And there they are, the object of all my hate and pain and everything that I don't like about the world, which right now is everything. <laughs> I'm sitting there having a cappuccino, which I think is awful anyway. Just have a coffee. Why'd you have to have a cappuccino? So anyway, I thought I gotta, I, you got to deal with it, right? you got to deal with it. I've said it before, you're just giving people rent space in your head. I think it was Philip Yancey or someone clever who said that. You know, if you've got bitterness in your heart and you start getting angry, it just tear you up, just starts to disturb your sleep and your mind gets contorted with hate, you know. So um, anyway, I, I saw them and I just felt this nudge from the Lord. Um, so I... Um, I walked in, uh, I, I walked to, she was sitting on the side outside the coffee shop. I just walked over and went, I went and said her name and went, Hi, <laughs> it's good to see you. What are you doing in London? And they were like, <laughs> <laughs> So I said, My train's not for 20 minutes. Do you mind if I join you? <laughs> so I got myself a proper coffee, filter coffee, none of this rubbish stuff. So, and um, sat down and, and said, Hey, um, hey, it's been been a bit sporty out there, isn't it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so time to have a cup of coffee together, and you know, and and they didn't know what to do with themselves. I, I it's actually a remarkably enjoyable experience, you know. And I just, I just praying while I'm sitting there, thinking, give me a love for this person, you know. Come on, Lord, just give me, give me a love for this person, you know. And we end up having this beautiful conversation that actually got to the heart of the matter, where we both agreed all we wanted were kids to be growing up knowing the Lord. And like we could agree on that. And I actually did say to him, I said, look, you know, 
like you know me and I know you and you don't need to attack me through Twitter or write a blog. You just pick up the phone and go, Beachy, can, can I add some subtle nuance to you? <laughs> your piece, you know. I said, and I'd listen to you. But I tell you, I also did. And I was absolutely convinced in my heart I'd not really done anything wrong. I'd not responded on Twitter. I'd not responded with hate blogs. I kept my devastating comments to myself. But I actually asked them to forgive me. And I felt it was the right thing to do. Because obviously something I'd done had caused a wound. Even if I couldn't perceive it myself. So I just said, look, before I go and get my train, and you don't need to answer me now, but what I do want to say to you is, would you forgive me? Because I think all this stuff has come because I hurt you. Because you've got some principles that are really foundational to your life. And I cut across that and I... I didn't, I didn't mean to hurt you. I, I was just talking objectively in this article, but for anything I've done, you know, would you forgive me? I just want to be at peace about it. And, and actually, they didn't answer me. But I thought, I'd done, I'd done my bit. I've got to get my heart right. It's the process of, st- of, of removing someone from being an object to being one of God's beautiful creations, and every single person is winnable and every situation is redeemable. Uh, a tip I could give you is, I, I would tend to view these things as an assignment from the Lord. View it as a mission. View it as a character test. View it as being, you know, part of being refined. So leading into that, just a reminder, the next bullet point, following on for that, sorry. You only have one enemy. We only have one enemy. And according to 1 Peter 5, 8, he's prowling around like a roaring lion looking for people to devour. People aren't your enemy. The enemy's the enemy. So remember that. Remember where the fight is. Uh, You know, in churches you see it all the time. People falling out with each other. Actually what the enemy's trying to do is divide us. Because people are becoming objects of your hate and your anger. There's only one enemy. It's not, I mean, how evil can a person actually be? They were born just like you were. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's Satan and his demons we need to be concerned about. And remember, you've only got one enemy. But within that, I would suggest that we don't want to start seeing the enemy in everything. So I, for instance, don't think that it was demonic that people nicked my stuff out of a trailer. I think it was just people being sinful. I don't think the enemy was attacking me because I was trying to raise money for charity. I don't think when we're organising a big mission and I trip over and sprain my ankle and it means I'm a bit delayed getting there, that that was a demon tripping me up. I don't see a demon behind every bush. Life is life. Sometimes there's satanic attack upon us and sometimes it's just life being life. I think we can over-glorify the work of the enemy sometimes. It's just a little caveat. Sometimes we sort of give him a little bit too much attention. I think the best thing we can do is just crack on, love the Lord, love people. Remember we've got one enemy, fight him, just smile back in the face of adversity and crack on, and the enemy will soon get bored with having a go at you because you're not giving him any attention. Next bullet point, uh, keep your heart soft. Proverbs 4, 23, guard your heart for it's a wellspring of life. Keep your heart as soft as you can. Keep it gripped in the love of Jesus. Fight hard to do that. You know, if you find yourself, you know, muttering under your breath about people, calling people stupid or, you know, you've got to deal with your heart, really. You know, as best you can, keep your heart soft. Keep it sweet. And keep it gentle. All of this will help you face the persecution and the insults when they come. It's like building up godly armor. Just keep your heart soft as best you can. Overlook an insult. Proverbs twelve sixteen says to do that. If someone insults you, overlook it. Just ignore it. Why do we pay attention to insults? It's insecurity, because you're worried about what people think about you. Only worry about one thing, 
Worry about how the Lord sees you. If you worry about how Jesus sees you, then the way you relate with people and the way you interact with people will generally fall into place, I think. Keep your heart soft. Look for the fruit of the Spirit in your life, the love, the joy, the peace, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, the, the self-control. Worry about what the Lord thinks and the rest will fall into place. Just so keep your heart incredibly tender. I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, an example. It, for me, it's like, which would be my final point really in one sense, it's, it's living a countercultural lifestyle. The kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. We don't respond as the world responds. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, your neighbour is putting a fence up and they're nicking two inches of your garden. Are you going to go to war over two inches of your garden? You'd be surprised how many people do. I had a neighbour who tried to nick about six inches of my garden with his fence. Do you know what I did? Burnt it. No, I didn't. I didn't. I helped him put it up. I'm not going to go to war over six inches of garden. It's a bit of grass. For goodness sake. We British are terrible for this. Seriously, we are so like island people. So every square inch we're going to fight over. What's the point? What's the point? I had a colleague of mine who was um, getting some building work done and his neighbour was absolutely shocking, swearing at him, swearing in front of his kids and giving him a hard time. And, he's, uh, and he was sort of going to swapping letters. I mean, living next door to each other, putting letters for each other's door. I mean, like, come on. So I just said, look, go to Majestics, buy him a box of wine, three nice bottles of white, three bottles of red, take around a bunch of flowers for his wife, and just say sorry. So I ain't done anything wrong. Get him a box of wine. <laughs> That's the flowers. Just say sorry. Kingdom of God's an upside down kingdom. And if it don't work, it was worth it, wasn't it? It's worth the risk. I used to live in this uh, terraced house. Um, when we first got married, 22 years ago, we had, we had lived in this row of terraces. And there was a little fence outside the front door. There's a little pathway and a little fence. And then there's one parking space opposite your house, unmarked. And then around the corner, there is a block of car parking spaces. And one of my neighbours kept parking on my space. <laughs> so I like, come home from opening me little Citroen AX. Do you remember them? Little Citroen AX. I used to love that little car. We know it now, though. Anyway, he used to park on, on, on my space. So I come back, I'm like, I can't. I've got to park my car around the corner. So I have one car. So I don't know how to deal with this. So I'm just about to start planting a church, actually. Because he's a wind-up, isn't it? He's a wind-up. You know, he's got two cars. He parks one on his driveway and one on my one. When he could just park his second car around the thing. So again, I've always... I think one of the things the Lord did for me was give me a revelation of the kingdom. So a lot of people talk about the kingdom being healing. and But for me, it's like this countercultural spirit. It's this... This upside down kingdom stuff. I think it's really important to me. And I think you see it flowing out of the Beatitudes, you know, the meekness and, you know, blessed you and your persecuting. If things are tough, just, just focus on heaven, you know. The Lord really touched me with that. So, anyway, I just said to this guy, um, I saw him outside the house, I went, hey, mate, um, do you, do you want to use my second space around the corner as well? I just, you know, because you know you're my space sometimes, but if you, you know, if you've ever got people around, you can use my spare space around the corner as well because I've only got the one car. I said, so what I do, if you're ever you're overspilling onto my one, what I do is I'll just park my car across on the road opposite because there's nowhere else really to park. Um, but, you know, you just got to give me a knock on the door and I'm, I'm you know, maybe you can move you, I'll move the car for you if I'm blocking you in on, on my space. So, just you know, just it's fine, mate. Just do know there's no, I'm not, you're not going to have a row with me about it. I just... But just let us know. You can use the other space around the corner whenever you want. Because I've only got one car. And he went, oh. Well, no, seriously, so I'm not being funny. It's just, just you can use it, but sometimes I'm going to block you in. So you're just going to knock on my door. and I'm not gonna, You're not going to get anger from me. 
It's fine. It's just a car parking space. Oh, never parked on it again. Never parked on it again. My dad, who's an ex-Met police detective, said, I'll get my keys out and key his car. <laughs> and I went, no. no. No, you can't do that. I'm planning in a church. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's the way it used to be in the East End, Dad. <laughs> but I kind of like that anymore. <laughs> but um, as far as I know, he never did it, hopefully. But I think it's a counter-cultural lifestyle, right? So, how does this all fit together? Blessed are you when people persecute you, insult you, say all false kinds of things about you. Well, if you're keeping your heart soft, if you're guarding your heart, you're walking with gentleness before the Lord, you are seeing every situation is winnable, every potential nightmare is redeemable. That work colleague that's winding you up, your neighbour who's doing your head in over the fence, the people making noise, the people who are insulting you or being antagonistic because you're a Christian. Every situation is redeemable. Every situation is winnable. You're keeping your heart soft. You're walking gently before the Lord. You're keeping your eyes up. You've got a sense of heaven on your shoulder. You will ride the storm. You will ride the storm. Take if you've got good people around you as well. Keep your heart right. You will ride the storm. And I'm telling you, the amount of people you will win round will blow your mind. The world expects you to go to war. That's what society does. We go to war over everything. We have been educated to do that by EastEnders and Coronation Street. They have taught us to go to war and to gossip and to slander. But see, every situation is winnable. Every situation is redeemable. Adopt the counter spirit and you will be amazed at the ground you will take. Now, there is a caveat. There are times when we need to guard our territory. There are times when there's an injustice. There are times when things are catastrophically bad and there is an injustice. There are times when very good things can be undermined. You could be in a work situation and you know that you're on the side of justice and the side of right. And sometimes you do need to dig deep and you need to fight your corner. But there is a way that we can do that. And you do it by not making the person who is opposing you or the situation that's opposing you an object. You keep it as winnable or redeemable. And sometimes I would suggest we need to play the long game. Just take a deep breath and choose your moment. There are just a couple of situations, as I was just thinking this through yesterday, a couple of situations I'm facing at the moment myself in a work context where it'd be so easy just to crash in and send an email or call a meeting and fight your corner back. But if you're keeping your heart soft and you're keeping yourself gentle before the Lord, sometimes that will give you the grace just to play more of a long-term game and just ride it through a little bit. Because something else I've noticed is that the truth always gets vindicated in the end. You need to remember that. Sometimes the Lord is fighting a battle for us, but we don't quite perceive it. When it all seems stacked against you, the truth will always come out. In preparing this talk, there is an injustice that I faced only six months ago and it all started to rise up within me again and I felt like I just Lord I just want to put that right just this gentle sense of the Lord saying the truth comes out in the end and 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 sometimes you just have to ride it a little bit do your bit stick to your guns but you can do it with a sense of grace and gentleness and sometimes you might even need to lose a little bit of face in front of people. Do you know that's true? Sometimes you have to lose an argument to win the overall war. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you have to lose a bit of face. Sometimes you have to suffer an insult for the greater good. Sometimes people have a wrong opinion of you and you just have to go with it. Do you know, Mother Teresa said, a beautiful thing, I will generally finish with this. 
um, I can't remember the quote precisely in my head, but she said a beautiful thing, which went something like this. You know, you will spend years building something, sometimes to watch people tear it all down afterwards. Build it anyway. You know, you will, you will sometimes say things and people will twist your words and it will be held as an untruth against you. Say things anyway. You know, the good you do will be accused of being bad or evil by someone else. Do good anyway. Just do it anyway. Keep your head. You're before an audience of one. We keep heaven on our shoulders and we ride the storm with grace and gentleness and the fruits of the Spirit pouring out of our lives, doing this upside down kingdom piece. And when the sharp edge of persecution comes or you're facing a tough time because of your faith or people are insulting you or saying all kinds of false things about you, I guarantee you will ride the stool much better. If you've got the character and the heart it's always a little bit chipped up. You're a bit chippy by nature. Even the smallest battle will take life out of you. Because you're just going to rise to it straight away. Principles for me. Do those things. Keep your heart soft. Stay gentle. Forgive quickly. Ask for forgiveness. Keep short accounts of the Lord. Remember, you've only got one enemy. Walk before heaven. Give it to heaven when it goes tough. Give it to heaven, Lord. Just give it to you. You know the truth. You know the truth. Best way we can live. Absolutely going to you.